Welcome back to another episode of the Casey Campbell podcast. Casey Campbell with you, of course. We are pleased to be joined by the one, the only Tommy Joe Martins, driver of the number 44 Chevrolet for Martins Motor Martins Motorsport. How's it going, man? Going really good, Casey. Thanks for having me on. All right. So what a run that you guys had at Darlington. We had you on a couple of weeks ago to talk about uh, the cool paint scheme and guys wore the great uniforms. Um, God, you must. And then after the race, you guys must have did a 10, 10, 3, 4, 5 commercial after that because goodness gracious it looks literally exactly like that but how fun was it to run that scheme because it was a it was one of my fan favorites I don't know if you saw the paint scheme show that Michael Carey and I did I had to make sure that I got yours in there because he didn't put it in his Rolodex for I don't know why but um uh, I he thought he did but he didn't and then I reminded him to do it how's it go but uh, overall how, how do you guys think he did and how cool was it to run that well scheme? I appreciate you shout it out Casey oh, yeah. yeah it was uh it was um it was really neat uh, and how the whole thing came about. Uh, Sam Hunt uh, reached out to me, kind of asked for his blessing uh, or my blessing on, on them running a Cal Petty scheme because he knew that's what I was going to do. Um, and we kind of put our heads together. I give credit to Jay Lopez, uh, one of my mechanics here on the on the 44 team. And um, he kind of came up with that idea. Hut Strickland was his guy growing up as a kid. Or not Hut Strickland, excuse me. Uh, Richard. I don't know why I touched Strickland on the brain right now. I just got old race car drivers on my, on my, on my brain. But Rich, Rich Bickle uh, was his guy growing up, uh, Wisconsin guy, Dan Stillman. Yeah. My crew chief from Wisconsin. So that was the idea, throwback to Rich, uh, who announced that he was retiring from racing uh, this year. And uh, that was kind of a neat throwback. Capital City Hauling was the company on the car. They're based out of South Carolina. They are a big help to us. They handle all of our trailer uh, maintenance and and taxes and kind of operating that vehicle and all that um, for us on the race team. So they do a lot for us. It was a home race for them down in South Carolina. And I feel like we put on a pretty good show. Uh, drove up to fifth uh, there in that that first stage yeah. with a little bit of tire strategy. Uh, felt like our car actually had a lot of speed in it. Uh, wound up blowing a tire, hitting the wall. Go two laps down, had to fight back, get the lucky dog, get back on the lead lap. And fought up there to a uh, to a fifteenth place on the track finish, and then with the nine uh, disqualification, uh, got bumped up to fourteenth. So that's a that's a good day. I really feel like, and, and I'm not just saying this uh, in retrospect here. Realistically, on a long run, we had a top twelve type of speed car, and, and with that, I, I'd like to have finished it off with the top ten. But the adversity that we had um, in the middle of the race, having to pit under green and going two laps down, having to Fight back, getting back on the lead lap, and even having a shot at it. I think that's a pretty good accomplishment. It says a lot about the team. No, oh, of course. You know, I, I know that a few weeks ago, I in kind of going back to the Rich Bickle stuff. I posted, I found a ten ten three four five commercial from from Rich Bickle yeah. that Miller did in the nineties. Yeah, and you were able to find and and you caught it, and you were able to find somebody in that commercial. What? Yeah, it was, it's actually, it was our engine builder, Rob Fisher, um, who is one of the, the suppliers that we get our engines from. Yeah. Does a tremendous job. Small, small company. Uh, they support Mike Harmon Racing, me. Um, they do a little bit for uh, Mario Goslin. Smaller teams in the, in the Xfinity field. And uh, Rob has been on his own. He, he had worked for Collins, Jeff Collins was another engine builder that he worked for, but now he took over that business. Rob's a great guy. Uh, we've worked with him now for a few different years. And uh, I immediately recognized his face in that Rich Mickle commercial. And so that was really neat to, to look back on that. And uh, I sent that video to uh, Rob, who immediately started laughing. He said, oh yeah, I got a face made for Hollywood. And uh, you know, so we, we all had a really good laugh about that. So I appreciate you finding that. I, can't, I didn't think I, I didn't think I'd find one because, you know, it's, uh, you know, Rich, the Rich Bickle 10, 10, 3, 4, 5, you know, car and stuff. I think Rich even, I think he, Rich even reacted to it too. So yeah. I, I really can't believe I found it. So that was uh credit to YouTube for like, you know, putting up these old NASCAR commercials, something we don't have today. We need more of them. We need more. I of agree. Them. And, and that's something that my roommate and I were talking about last, uh, last night a little bit was the idea that, there really has been a lack of those type of commercials as a whole for the whole sport. I mean, you had guys that were on Bush teams 
back in the day, they were still getting that sort of activation from the sponsorships um, that they had. And, you know, we, we talk about living in a B2B world where all these are B2B things like Rick Hendrick. Uh, sorry to break everybody's heart here. They are not sponsored by Exalta. Uh, so Exalta does not write them a big check every year and say, here's your money. R Rick Hendrick is the biggest car dealer in America. And uh, they own a lot of body repair and, and paint shops <laughs> and so, because they repair a lot of cars. And so the, who do they buy their paint from? Exalta. So is that a sponsorship or is that a B2B deal? Well, it's a B2B deal. So now the thing is Exalta is going, well, I'm getting this for free. They don't have to spend the money on a campaign. They're not, they're not putting out that money the same way that we did in the 1990s. And so the dynamic there has changed so much, I think to the negative, personally, yeah. uh, but, but it is what it is. And so it's getting people to activate at that level alongside their sponsorship. Another reason is the cost of sponsorship case. He writes so much money uh, to, to be on one of those bigger teams, to be on a team that is considered a successful team um, in our sport that you spend already spending so much money. You don't want to go spend another million dollars on a national ad campaign or something like that. You don't want to do that. And the cost of making the commercial and everything involved with it. Uh, so there's a lot of factors that go into that, right? It, it's easy for us to sit here and go, man, I wish there were more of those. And you got to understand the dynamics of, of why they're not. That's why I think it's so cool when you watch an ARCA race that you notice there's actually a lot of commercials in an ARCA race. Yeah. Well, there's those smaller sponsors. So that begs the question, well, then why is that not happening in NASCAR? Yeah. Well, it's, it's probably because in the ARCA series, it costs a lot less to compete. That's number one. Right. And number two, ARCA as an organization is probably not as stingy with their copyright as NASCAR is. So for that same company, they probably have to pay NASCAR to do a national ad campaign, as well as the money they're spending on that, as well as the money they're spending to sponsor a team. So all that factors into this. And, and I agree. I think that would be a huge benefit to the sport to maybe relax some of those copyright rules. If we can get the cost to compete down a little bit, I think you would see those type of activation things go up. Yeah, of course. I mean, we, I mean, there are a few companies out there that we're kind of starting to see, you know, companies like Ally, has featured Jimmy and Alex Bowman, of course, carparts.com announced that might, they're going to start a national ad campaign with Michael McDowell. Yeah. I mean, I think we're kind of, as the sport is. Domino's, Domino's with Denny Hamlin. And Ryan Newman they're running. With Ryan Ryan Newman. So, of course, I mean, you know, I know Kurt Busch has been in his fair share of commercials. You know, Toyota has featured some of the Toyota guys. Um, in theirs and you know I mean Logano and Keselowski and a lot of and of course Kevin Harvick's commercials in the past so it's uh, it's going to come back but you know it, it'll be uh, it, it's going to be a process but I think uh, we'll start seeing some more of those but anyway you know of course you know we're always you know talking about new tracks new places about where we're going of course the Nashville Fairgrounds meeting was last night I don't know how much you've raced at the fairgrounds but what do you think about do you think we should do you think you want to see NASCAR or at least maybe like, you know, the trucks or the Xfinity series, maybe to start off with, and maybe eventually to go to the cup series? Cause I know there's also a lot of hurdles to get by too. Yeah. And you're talking to a Nashville fairgrounds veteran. I raced there for four or five years there kind of during my beginnings uh, in late models. And really before we ran our Xfinity series team in 2014 and have kind of converted over to this side of the world now since 2014, uh, doing this full time, uh, I ran National Fairgrounds late models for five years from 2008 to 2013. I was running there all the time. And it's, it's a track that has lived in this perpetual yearly, all right, are we closing down? Or are we staying open? And it's been through this cycle several times with different owners, different operators um, of the track. Uh, the fair board still owns the contract, but they basically give it out to a person that's going to run the track for a certain period of time. Um, there's a no a new ownership group that's in there now. Uh, and, and also Marcus Smith has expressed his interest in getting really involved with, with SMI. Uh, and I think that's, that's the future of this. They're going to possess the infrastructure, the money, the knowledge to build up the fairgrounds into something that is going to be a national series capable racetrack which it is it is just not capable of being right now it's not it doesn't have the infrastructure i love everybody's enthusiasm about it and i will say this casey from a racing standpoint 
it is the perfect size racetrack to host a NASCAR national series race. It's a five eighths mile track. It races fast. The corners are big, wide corners, multi-groove racing, worn out racetrack. Um, and it's historic and it's in a prime location in Nashville, but not on the outskirts of Nashville, which is where we're going to go race at Nashville super speedway. It is in Nashville, which is a super desirable market for us to activate as a sport and combine that with the country music uh, aspect of it too. I mean, there, there are a hundred check marks. People want more short tracks. Here's a short track. People like worn out racetracks. Here's a worn out racetrack. People like high speeds. It's a really fast short track for what it is. People like historic venues. Here it is. I mean, it checks all the boxes that you want it to check. So are we going to go there? Yeah, we're going to go there. And when I watched that fair board meeting last night and some of the clips from it, of course, I see so many people posting the clip of the, the woman that said there was five, uh, there was NASCAR race, Formula One races around there. Okay, I, obviously that's, that's wrong, right? That's low hanging fruit. We can all make fun of it. But what we all need to understand is that there, the people that are sitting in that meeting, the people that are responding to all this, they're not NASCAR people. The fair board is not, they're not racing people. So when that kind of thing goes up, they go, oh yeah, they write that down just like everything else. So we can all make fun of it, but everybody just needs to understand these are legitimate concerns that are being brought up to this board. And they're going, oh, well, they're doing the Music City Grand Prix with, with IndyCar, because that's what she meant, not Formula One. But they are doing the Music City Grand Prix in Nashville. That's a real thing yes. for everybody that's making fun of it. And there is a NASCAR race out there in the sticks on the outside part of town. Nashville Super Speedway. Super Speedway, right? We're running there. Yep. And she's going, oh, well, there's three of those. And we're running the Music City Grand Prix. Why do we have to have this stupid fairgrounds? It's right here next to my house. Valid concern. It's whether we want to sit here and scream about it. And of course, I'm on the side of, well, you chose to move next to a racetrack, right? Of course, I'm on that side. Yes. And I think anybody with any logic probably could say the same thing. But it is a concern. It's been brought up dozens and dozens and dozens of times. People do this every year. I, the NASCAR crowd is new to this. <laughs> they're, they're new to the fairgrounds politics stuff let me tell you i've been part of that and been around those conversations for 12 years now it's every year we should shut it down no we shouldn't too much history well it's too noisy well it's polluting the atmosphere i mean it's everything that you can say under the sun and these fair board people have to deal with this now here's what's going to make the decision casey will this make money and do we have to spend any money for it to make money and if Marcus Smith comes in here and goes, I'm paying for everything, but I want the, the profit, but it's not going to be on y'all. And we're going to restore this and we're going to put a plan together where you're going to get your MLS stadium and we're going to have the fairgrounds and it's not going to interfere with that. Then we're going to move forward. And if we can't do that, if Marcus Smith and them say, no, we actually want a bunch of Nashville money to help with this, then that it, I'm telling you, there's absolutely a way that this doesn't work. Yeah. And, you know, no one would know that better than you do, because, of course, you know, you're in you've raced in Nashville. You are. I'm not. Are you, you're from the area. If I'm not I literally worked for Nashville Fairground Speedway. I did that for about six months in 2014 at the beginning or really 2013. It was the back end of 2013 yeah. before we started our uh, our NASCAR team. I was living in Nashville. I worked at a, a radio station selling advertisements. And I was miserable and I wanted to work in racing and I felt like the fairgrounds was kind of an untapped potential type place. Yeah. And I wanted to work on the marketing side and help them out. Now, I didn't get along at all with the guy that was the, the operator of that at the time, he was a guy named Tony Formosa. He didn't really understand what marketing was. Uh, so we had, we had very different opinions yeah. on, on the way things are working out. So it didn't work out with me working over there, you know, all credit to them. They took the fairgrounds and operated it for several years there. And really, I feel like it was like a slow drip where people eventually started realizing what a great facility it was. It put on great racing. They ran big races there, big money late model races. And I feel like it was almost like a can't miss. Did I disagree with Tony on some stuff? Yeah, I did. I worked there. I just felt like the property itself, the racetrack, the history as a whole, 
it was almost too good to fail. Like you have almost had to like completely screw it up for it to really fail because it's just too good of a place. And I feel like NASCAR, once they get their hands around it, especially Marcus Smith, as smart as that guy is, um, as forward thinking as he is, it's we're not talking, Casey, just Xfinity or trucks. Yeah. This is cup. This is going to be a cup destination. We have our uh, our banquet in Nashville. We're going to have a cup race in Nashville. I promise you that. And they want to have it at the fairgrounds. Yeah. So where do you, I mean, I know obviously you listen to the meetings as much as I did. Where are we at? In, I don't know. If, I think July 12th is the deadline for that. And what's what's got to have, what are some of the things that you think are still in, in that are in like, a bunch of red tape that still has to get crossed. I, mean. I think if we're talking about conceding versus getting, uh, they're probably going to have to give up some local races is probably what's going to happen, yeah. right? Because the people that are there are going to say, well, we don't want to open this up to nine local events every year, which is going to basically be noisy for three days during the local events. Okay, so that's 27 days. Plus test days, there's 30 of those. All right, so now we got 57 days plus the NASCAR weekend. All right, so that's another so 60 days of the year. And I don't think people want that, right? I mean, the people around there, the concession they're gonna have to give is, well, we're gonna probably knock this down to six local events or something like that yeah. with a focus on, on the super speedway or excuse me, on, on the big stuff with NASCAR. I think that's probably gonna be the give and take there if I would see. So it's probably gonna hurt the local racing there a little bit. Would it necessarily hurt it to give up a few dates? Eh, probably not, because then you're going to be thinking big picture with the Speedway. And I'm telling you what the city is concerned about. If I think about politician wise, they're really concerned about the MLS team. Yeah, That's really where their concern is. Uh, the NASCAR thing is like, this is kind of nice, whatever. This is it's, it's, that it's there, that it's an option. Yeah. But really, more people care about the MLS team than care about this NASCAR race, which, by the way, tough pill for NASCAR to swallow. Right, Casey? Because that's the facts. Unfortunately, more people care about this MLS stadium yeah, than care yeah. about Nashville getting a NASCAR race. Yeah, more people care about the MLS team than people care about uh, getting the Music City Grand Prix. And yet, as a sport, we like to carry ourselves like look at our TV ratings. Oh, MLS doesn't get any ratings. And all that. You know, what I'm telling you is the groundswell of people in Nashville, Music City, Southern home of country music. As a whole, as a population, they care more about the MLS team than the NASCAR track. Well, there's so also we we as a sport, Casey, we have to come to realize that yeah. that we're not negotiating from a place of power here. Right. We're, we're negotiating from the other side of the table. Yeah, because then and then there's also I don't know if you heard, but there Nashville is also rumored to be where maybe possibly the Oakland A's could relocate as well. So now you're talking about. Could we could they have an MLB team because they do currently don't have one. they currently don't have one. So it's, um, you know, there's all that there's all that concerns. And that would be on top of something there, because, you know, as much as you know, we, I mean, they have the Nashville Sounders, but, you know, Major League Baseball is if that were to come in there, that's I don't know what would happen there, because then you'd have to then we'd have to do this all over again. But what the thing is. Another thing, and I didn't think we talked about the fairgrounds today, but what, I mean, what's the, what are, why are residents so up in arms about the fairgrounds? Is it because it's in the middle of the city? Yeah, it's right next to a residential neighborhood. I mean, it is. Uh, for people that haven't been around the fairgrounds, yeah, it does basically pop out of a neighborhood. You know what else pops out of a neighborhood? Mid-Ohio. Yeah. If anybody's never been there, you basically drive through somebody's parking lot you know you drive through somebody's yard to get to mid ohio it basically just comes out of nowhere so you know th there's a version of this that it's happened before right but anytime you put a racetrack like this in a place like I, somebody posted this on on twitter whatever probably last year or anytime this debate comes up and it's a meme but it's basically like the history of racetracks. And, and I'm going to butcher this, but everybody bear with me here. It basically shows like racetrack is put in a place where the land is cheap, yeah. right? So the land is cheap generally in a pretty crappy part of town, right? Or on the outskirts of town. Well, what naturally happens over the course of years? The town expands or because the racetrack is now there, other businesses fill in around the racetrack, right? 
So now with that, here comes the residential community and they fill in around the racetrack. And then once that happens, the people that buy the housing, which is normally cheap because it's next to a racetrack, then they get annoyed that there is a racetrack there. So then they complain about the racetrack. And then the racetrack generally gets shut down. They convert the racetrack into something else. The property value of the houses go up and they're happy and the racetrack's done. And that's generally the cycle of this. Look at a lot of short tracks around the country. It's the same story, which is it was generally built in a place where there was nothing around it. Other stuff kind of pops up around it. People buy into that because it's cheap. And then it's like, oh my God, this stupid racetrack. If only we would get rid of this stupid racetrack. And then there it is. And that's the cycle. So, yeah. I mean, uh, it's it's going to be quite the interesting, uh, it's going to be quite the interesting two months for National Fairgrounds to see uh, what would happen. I know there's a lot of push to get this uh, to get this done and uh, we'll definitely see if it, uh, if it actually happens or not. But anyway. I think it's done, Casey. I really do. I think it gets done. I think there's just going to be concessions that are going to have to be made. And understanding what the big picture is for everybody here, it's not NASCAR. That, that's not the fairgrounds main concern right now. It is getting that MLS stadium built and the NASCAR stuff. If Marcus Smith wants to dive into this, if he puts together a good plan, they'll let him. Okay. So, yeah. Um, of course, NASCAR, the Xfinity series on their way to Dover this weekend. Um, what, what are we going to expect at the monster mile? It's always a tough track and you know how much miles like to eat race cars. Uh, yeah. Uh, that's a place. <laughs> Uh, Dover's a place where you very quickly realize how fast you're going when you need to stop. Yeah. Um, and the track blocks very easily. Um, and that place does eat race cars. There, there are no, there are no easy hits at Dover. You're going too fast. Um, and there's nowhere else to go except a wall. There's a wall on the inside and the outside part of the racetrack. Um, it generally, generally has long green flag runs. That's what we expect when we go to Dover. Um, so a little more of a traditional race in that sense, but there's going to be parts of the race that are going to be chaotic. I mean, we got some guys in the Xfinity field right now. We're going to a place next week where we have to qualify. We got to qualify at Circuit of the Americas. We got to qualify at, at Charlotte next week. And yeah. there are teams at the back end of the Xfinity series field right now that are really, really worried about their positioning for a provisional going into those races where we are not going to start 40 cars. We're going to be starting 36. So with that, they're going, oh my gosh, I'm down to the points. And you've seen Johnny Davis swap Landon Castle down to the six car and Vargas to the four. Why is that? Well, he's hoping Landon can pick that number up a little bit, maybe jump him ahead of a couple people, maybe lock him into the race. BJ McLeod is driving his own 99 car this week. Well, why is that? Well, he's trying to jump a few people and potentially position that 99 car to where maybe it doesn't have to qualify in on time, right? But there's a lot of jockeying going around. And, and here at Dover, that's kind of the last place to do it because the next two weeks we're going to be qualifying. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, re you know, it's really up in the And who know? And I think that's also why J.J. Yaley's in the 23 this week. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. And, yeah. and they're looking at that like, we got to get a guy – they can get us up in the points with this car because they're sitting 30th and they're worried about qualifying in on time. Right. De definitely. Uh, definitely for sure. All right. Tommy Joe Martins, thank you so much for coming on. Um, good luck this weekend at Dover and uh, let's have you on again sometime because you always bring a lot of great perspective on the sport as well. Well, thanks Casey. I appreciate you having me on.